I'm sorry, waiting for the technical cue. Um, I am delighted to open up this panel on what can be done. What is the role of external powers in addressing demo back democratic backsliding? Um, my name is, many of you know, is Anne Marie Murphy. I am a professor uh, at the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall and a founding uh, partner of the New York Southeast Asian Network, which is sponsoring this. Um, we are delighted to have with us today two experts who um, both bring different uh, aspects to this topic of the role of external powers. We are absolutely thrilled to have Evan Laksamana with us today. Um, Evan is doing us all a huge favor by getting up extremely early in um, Singapore to join us today. Um, Evan is a senior research fellow with the Center on Asia and Globalization at the National University of Singapore's Lee Guan Yew School of Public Policy. And he is also a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie uh, China Council, as well as the Lowy Institute for International Policy. Um, Evan's expertise is on military change, civil and political military relations, and regional security in Southeast Asia. He is one of the region's leading strategic analysts, and so he brings an inside-out um, perspective to this topic. We are also delighted to have Yong Soon with us today. She is a senior fellow and a co-director of the East Asia program at the Stimson Center. And she also is uh, the director of the US uh, China program uh, there as well. Um, she brings a uh, long record of expertise in Chinese foreign policy, US-China competition, and she uh, especially looks at relations with neighboring states, particularly Myanmar. So we are delighted to have them with us today. I think we are going to um, let Evan kick us off. And then um, we will turn the table over to Yoon. You can see that we've had this lovely um, kind of conversational setting. I'm feeling very lonely today because all of the other panels had these nice interactions and the, the presider wasn't lonely up at the front. Um, so I am actually going to go sit down in a place where you won't be able to see me um, for your presentations, and then I'll be back here to moderate the Q&A. So thank you so much. Um, Evan, over to you. Uh, thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, it's always good to see you again, although it's still uh, virtually. Um, I would have loved to have come uh, to New York myself, um, but I didn't get my visa until literally uh, two days ago. <laughs> so obviously that's that's rather pointless. Um, but uh, good, uh, good morning here for, uh, from Singapore and good evening uh, to everyone there um, in New York. Um, so today I'll just speak very briefly on the challenges, I think, uh, for external powers in their support for democracies or to prevent uh, democratic backsliding. Um, but this time I want to take a little bit of a comparative angle and look at how the U.S. has done um, these types of activities with Indonesia and sort of think about it when it comes to ASEAN and whether or not ASEAN can support uh, the prospect of, uh, of returning Myanmar back to democracy. And hopefully uh, from you, you know, this, albeit unperfect, uh, imperfect uh, comparison, we can have uh, some further discussions about the promises and pitfalls of the role of external powers uh, in supporting democracies. So first, uh, before uh, we go into uh, the specifics, I think the initial starting point uh, that we should ask is whether or not external powers should support democracies and prevent uh, backsliding in the first place. Now, this is sort of a, a, a moot point for many of us who seem to think that the answer is always going to be yes. Uh, but looking at it from the perspective of the recipients like Indonesia, I always feel like it's not a straightforward question because whether or not they should support uh, democracies is often um, uh, lost in, in, in the challenges that the fact is there are and there have been plenty of second order effects and unintended consequences of those democracy promotion activities. It's certainly the case in Indonesia when uh, the US and many Western countries supported Indonesia's transition in 1998 um, and maybe about four or five years after and then left. There's a lot of things 
that uh, was started uh, with the support of the external powers in that period uh, that remains unresolved until today, from electoral systems to the nature of civil military relations. So the challenge, I think, if, if the answer is truly yes, that external power should support democracies, it should not be done with a cavalier attitude that we can come and we can fix things. But will you stay longer? Will there be a long-term framework? How do you know if you're successful? What are the benchmarks of success? Uh, is it just an open-ended commitment to always support democracy in whatever shape or form, or is there a specific set of policy benchmarks that you're looking for? And I think this is a crucial question that, uh, that we need to ask at the beginning. Now, looking at the case of, of the U.S. and Indonesia, before I, I go to the case of ASEAN and Myanmar, in the case of U.S. and Indonesia, um, first of all, I think it will be great if, if today the U.S. doesn't talk about democracy and, and, um, and autocracies and all of that in its foreign policy. I think a values-based approach to foreign policy is just, you know, there's no one who wants to take it on um, uh, these days in Southeast Asia. The U.S. is standing on these issues seems to be pretty uh, hard to take when uh, the U.S. invited our current defense minister, Prabowo Subianto, uh, to the steps of the Pentagon. So in that sense, uh, uh, it's, it's a meaningless overture that might make a lot of people in the U.S. feel good, but it's kind of uh, meaningless in the context of Indonesia. Uh, that being said, uh, I do think that there are specific, uh, you know, key policy areas that one would say would be related to the strengthening of Indonesia's uh, democracy, uh, which hasn't been been sort of addressed. First is obviously the issue of political party building. Now, in the first few years of 1990s, uh, of the late 1990s, certainly the National Democratic Institute and the International Re Republican Institute uh, helped support and help build uh, uh, those uh, party building activities. Today, most Indonesian uh, major political parties send their major uh, political uh, cadres to Chinese Communist Party school, not necessarily because of those uh, communist ideologies and all that, but it's about political party building and access to the CCP elites. So within the context of building party cohesion and managing uh, local parties and local elections across Indonesia's uh, 34 provinces is, is certainly something uh, that many uh, within Indonesia's uh, political elite are still uh, looking for. Uh, second, in terms of civilian defense community and civil and military relations, uh, Indonesia is, is certainly still very much uh, a, a long way to go before achieving its own defense transformation. Now, while the military is officially out of politics, uh, it's certainly still a long way from becoming a fully professional military, and certainly the pandemic has, has opened up the door for the military to make a return. So within this context, what the U.S. has done in the past uh, was to support um, these kinds of efforts with building civil defense community, which no longer seems to be the case. So we have a, a fracturing civil defense community, which is unable to provide a balance and a counter check uh, to what the military has been doing. Now, aside from these two areas, certainly uh, there are a wide number of, of issues from electoral system management, uh, corruption in the law enforcement to the nature of the digital ecosystem uh, that I think remains uh, unresolved for Indonesia's uh, policy capacity building and, and activities. But the point being, I think overall, is that a lot of the complexities and challenges that Indonesia has had to deal with stems from the fact that there was some initial support at the beginning and nothing in the middle and until today. So now we have to wrestle with our own and that means there's a vacuum in which uh, if we were uh, in need of some assistance and we go to other countries, we can offer it, including China. Now, how does this compare with what ASEAN is trying to do, at least in the case of Myanmar? And I think this is relevant because a lot of the debates within ASEAN over the past two years is exactly the same set of questions. If we are to provide a support uh, for Myanmar that would bring them back to the path of democracy, are we ready for an ASEAN long-term commitment for Myanmar? Because we certainly weren't ready in the 1990s when we brought Myanmar into the fold uh, as a member of ASEAN. Once uh, Myanmar becomes a member, we just let them be. Very few uh, strong interactions on the political security and 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 people to people and certainly on the economic front outside of Thailand um, and Singapore. So in that sense, it's it's the same side of debate. Many uh, in in the ASEAN policymakers uh, over the past two years in those ASEAN meetings uh, were simply um, saying that you know let 
uh, the Myanmar people sort things out themselves. We should provide some modest role from the outside, while others believe, no, it's our responsibility. This is not a problem of, of great powers. This is literally an ASEAN problem, uh, but nobody is really prepared to provide that long-term blueprint. And I think this is uh, quite challenging because within the context of the ASEAN charter and and the reasons why ASEAN has been trying to push uh, Myanmar uh, further is precisely because in the ASEAN Charter, there are clauses about inconstitutional changes of, gov of government, about human rights, and so forth. And this is where I think the five-point consensus could be evolving uh, with Indonesia as, as the ASEAN chair. Now, certainly the debate is not finished, and certainly uh, um, uh, there are conversations happening right now, both at the track one and at the track two level. But it's certainly, I think the first issue for Indonesia within the context of providing support for democracy is whether or not there's appetite and, and whether or not there's plan. The plan, certainly not right now. As I understood it, there is no uh, systematic plan laid out just yet. Uh, what that means uh, in terms of both the five-point consensus and the long-term roadmap. Uh, and from an appetite standpoint, I think that's still being worked out. We see uh, uh, yesterday, for example, uh, Jokowi starting to speak out about Myanmar and even uh, hinting that he might send uh, someone uh, from the military to go to Myanmar. It's not clear who that person is. Is it uh, an ex-military uh, reformer who was involved uh, in reforming the military in, the, uh, in 1998, or is it a current active uh, military officer? Um, it's still being, um, uh, being worked out. So from an appetite standpoint, I think it's not lost. Uh, I think we might still get to see something, but from a plan, um, and this goes back to the point about having a deeper understanding of what's going on in Myanmar, what do they need and how do we know if we're successful? I think that's still being worked out as well at the track two level. But from a comparative standpoint, I think the challenges that ASEAN will face will be kind of a, a little bit similar uh, with how the US uh, did democracy assistance to Indonesia in the early 2000s. Which specific areas are we going to help Myanmar in? For example, uh, to what extent um, can ASEAN facilitate all inclusive dialogue as one of the key mandates of the five point consensus would requires us to understand who the key actors are. And this is why I think things are slightly changing because I think the mood in Jakarta is that we need to find an alternative to both the SAC and NUG. And this means allowing us to engage in ethnic groups and, and the other parties within the process. So, but uh, to, to wrap things up, I think from a comparative uh, standpoint, I think the challenges of external powers is obviously first the challenge of knowledge. To what extent uh, uh, the external powers have deep understanding of the challenges and the needs, uh, not just short term, but long term uh, for the domestic actors. Number two is obviously uh, resources and commitment. Uh, to what extent uh, you want to put resources into it is not just a one time thing, the way that some people thought about the five point consensus, but sort of a long term commitment. Do you have a 10 year time frame? Do you know what it takes to measure certain outcomes of your uh, democracy assistance? And whether or not you build um, and this is my last point, sustainable platforms and pathways of engagement that will outlast any government, or in this case of ASEAN, that would outlast any ASEAN chairmanship. And this is where I think uh, the challenge lies because it's not a necessarily a straightforward normative issue of whether or not we should do it, but how we do it and, and do it in a more sustainable way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evan, for kicking us off with that. Um, Yoon, over to you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. It's so good to see you on the screen. You said we last time it was still before COVID and we were having great gatherings in, uh, in, in New York. So I really miss the conferences that you used to host and hopefully that we can resume that offline one day, <laughs> hopefully later this year. Um, so I will primarily just focus on China's role and China's impact over the, demo the democratic backsliding in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and with, uh, we sometimes spend on the case of Myanmar because uh, this is, Myanmar is probably the most severe case that we have seen in the past decade um, in terms of the democracy backsliding in the, in the region. And China does play the role of the largest patron of uh, of the country. Uh, it still maintains a close political and economic relations with the military government. So what is China's policy? How does China look at the prospect of Myanmar's future politics? 
I think it deserves some uh, some specific deliberation. Uh, first, I, I think it should not be news to people to 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 the audience that uh, China is not necessarily the supporter of democracy in Southeast Asia. Uh, and this is not just because uh, China's own political system is not, well, China is not a liberal democracy, and China follows a one-party system. Um, it, it calls itself a, a, a people's democracy, but uh, we also know that there is no direct election involved in the, in the Chinese politics. So reflecting that on, on foreign policy, what the Chinese have been calling for is something that what they call uh, the internationalization of, in, of the, I'm sorry, the um, democratization of the international, rela uh, international relations, and also emphasize the diversity was the need and the reality of diversity of the political conditions and political reality in different countries, basically pointing to one conclusion that Western democracy is not a universal value. It does not have to be embraced by all countries in the world. Uh, and China's current political system is not only is not only in um, is not only legitimate because it has people's endorsement, but also because uh, looking across the globe, the true uh, the number of the true democracies or the true liberal democracy, electoral democracy, as we call it, um, if we look at the pure number, the Chinese will argue that. True democracy or Western democracies are the absolute minority in the uh, in the world of politics. So I think this, either from uh, from both the domestic political point of view or from a foreign policy point of view, the Chinese goal is very clear. It is to sub substantiate the claim that Western democracy is not the only option, and other countries are able, and also. Um, eligible to pursue different political systems. And the China model, which China, uh, which people have been talking about for the past two decades, which combines state, um, sorry, state, uh, state authoritarianism with economic capitalism, so state capitalism, um, the Chinese believe that they have chartered a different course that has been proven effective and viable And you see that this, uh, this conviction is reflected in for example, senior leader statements like Xi Jinping's uh, speech at the 19th, part, uh, 19th Party Congress when he declared that China has offered the world an alternative path to governance and to development. And China wishes to offer this alternative path as China's contribution of, uh, of, of the Chinese wisdom to, to the world. So this is to say that the... When China looks at the democracy in Southeast Asia or democracy, democratic countries across the globe, they don't necessarily see the political regime or the regime type as a criteria or dividing line that would determine China's relationship with these countries. Regardless of whether a country is authoritarian or is democratic, they all need relationship with China, especially in terms of economic relations. But coming to the specific political relations, for countries that are not following the democracy or the democratic system, I think the Chinese have always taken take into consideration that this is a special factor in the bilateral relations, and we do uh, we we see this in China's relationship with uh, um, with 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 countries in Southeast Asia, with countries in Central Asia, with countries in in Africa. So this is a, a I would say a distinct feature of uh, of of China's foreign policy. Um, in terms of the backsliding of democracy in Southeast Asia, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make a, attribute this to China or China's policy towards these countries. In other words, I don't believe that China is a cause for the backsliding. But then the next question is, what kind of role has China played in the process? And I think that's where we can identify the role in terms of support, in terms of assistance, especially support and assistance for authoritarian governments and authoritarian leaders in the process that uh, at least has not contributed to the strengthening of democracy or the democratic systems in these countries. Um, like for example, um, Evan mentioned some of these Chinese political trainings, this political party training, 
um, that now has been made available basically to all developing countries in the world, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in even Latin America. China does offer what they call the uh, the governance training or the government governance capacity building for uh, for governments and also for ruling party elites. Uh, and this training, depending on the, the seniority of the participants, if they are ministerial level uh, cadres and elites, they would be trained in Beijing. If they are lower level uh, government officials like DG level or local level officials, they usually would be trained at a local facility or local party school in China, usually at the provincial capitals. And especially for Southeast Asia, I think the example of um, um, the political party or the elite training for uh, Vietnam and for Laos in the province of Guangxi is, uh, is, is, a, is a very good example to show how things are, how things are done because Guangxi borders Vietnam and Guangxi has uh, the specialty of uh, Vietnamese language. So in terms of the leadership training program that they have set up, there's no problem for them to conduct the training or conduct the courses in, uh, in, in Vietnamese language. And the, 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 the goal of this training is really to present China's development model, both in terms of political governance, as well as economic decision-making as a model offered as a model for other countries to copycat, for other countries to learn from, and also for other countries to identify whether there are those grounds for these models or for these experiences to be replicated in their, uh, in their country. We're also seeing that uh, China provides, um, for example, trying to influence the local media and civil society organization in Southeast Asia, bringing media elites, opinion leaders to China for uh, not necessarily for training, but for exchange programs where, where they were um, hosted very, uh, let's say, generously um, in order to use this type of tri trips and this type of exchanges to build goodwill. And this is, again, not unique to Southeast Asia. We also see this here, for example, in the United States. We also see this in, in Africa. So Southeast Asia is definitely not the, the, the unique case here. Uh, China has provided both in terms of uh, both hardware and software to help uh, authoritarian governments in Southeast Asia to counter the democratic movements in their country. And here, uh, I think the, the Burmese case is a pretty is a pretty striking one. So after the military coup of uh, February 1st, 2020, 2021, the Chinese provided what they call uh, law enforcement assistance to the uh, civilian police in, in Myanmar. So these would include um, actual law enforcement equipment that Burmese police used in suppressing or in countering the uh, the CDM the uh, the demonstrations that have happened in uh, in big cities in uh, in in Myanmar, um, China has also provided the assistance both hardware and uh, and and software in terms of digital surveillance of uh, of local population. So these are not just how to um, use a surveillance system to monitor the population in uh, in 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 actual life, but also include the online the digital surveillance that focuses on the oppositional views and the critical views of the local government. Part of this um, part of this is not, well, the motivation question is a very interesting one because uh, if you look at Southeast Asia, why is China making the effort or taking these policies, try to expand their own political ideal and try to undermine, maybe not deliberately, but in reality undermine the, 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 the democracy on the ground um, part of it is domestic politics. I think the Chinese feel innately vulnerable when they're surrounded by uh, by democracies on, on on its border. Because uh, an, another example that comes to mind is that um, when the um, when the Arab Spring happened and when Myanmar adopted political reform starting in 2011, uh, one of the direct impact over China is that you saw this surge of questions in, in the Chinese society that if countries in the Middle East and a country like Myanmar are even making progress politically in towards political liberalization, then what does that say about China's domestic politics? So why is Chinese Communist Party still refusing to embrace some of these, what they call the, uh, the trends that would represent the progress of human race? 
So this was particularly striking, I remember back in 2011, 2012, because there was this surge of oppositional views in the Chinese society when they saw that, well, even a country like Myanmar can liberalize. So why are we still waiting? Are we, are we not even better than them? So I think there is this, uh, this identification of potential vulnerability when countries on China's border or countries with a long authoritarian history started to pursue political uh, political progress or political reforms. And it does directly reflect back in China, regardless of how Chinese Communist Party claimed that they, they have the performance legitimacy. And another key reason for this Chinese um, Chinese mobilization to counter or to uh, maybe not to undermine democracy, but at least to uh, to spread the Chinese voice is to counter the American influence. So the expansion of democracy or the expansion of democratic voices in the region as sponsored and supported, like Evan pointed out, uh, by the United States is seen as a direct challenge and a direct damage to China's national interest. And we know that U.S. organizations such as NDI, IRI, and NED, they're all on the Chinese blacklist. So remember when, uh, again, using Myanmar as an example, when Myanmar first adopted the political reform back in 2011, 2012, uh, the Chinese firmly believe it was a, the so-called black hand of the Americans that are, are behind these, uh, these political movements that later proven to be, to be indigenous. Um, so how to counter the expansion of the American influence very quickly, this, once the democracy or the, the, the issue of democracy, either backsliding or expanding in Southeast Asia is viewed through the lens of great power competition, it suddenly carries a different layer of significance or strategic significance for China. It becomes a battle of life or death. And I think this anxiety or this uh, this vulnerability when China looks at well, basically the, the the Chinese also perceive there is a dominoes effect once a democracy started to roll. Like uh, if you think about the Arab Spring and what happened in Myanmar back in 2011, um, they are extremely worried that maybe maybe it will be the end of history for uh, for the for for the for the Chinese Communist Party. So there is that angle as well. Uh, a, a few minutes, just uh, very quickly, to talk about the case of uh, the case of Myanmar. So the the military coup has been has been there for two years, and we know that the domestic politics in Myanmar has fallen into the abyss of uh, of chaos and military conflicts and unending um, fighting between the the Burmese military and the and the resistance movement. Um, I think the Chinese goal or the Chinese position on the Myanmar political uh, reality is that it may not support um, democracy. In fact, I think the Chinese priority is to support some sort of political reconciliation. And that's also how they identify the solution to the Myanmar problem will look like. That eventually the Burmese military has been there for more than seven decades. It will be impossible, and we have seen that Aung San Suu Kyi tried, and now they tried to use constitutional revision, to use legal, uh, to use legislation, to try to bring the Burmese military under civilian control, and we have seen what that would render, what would that, what what that would lead to. So I I, I think the um the conclusion that a lot of the Chinese uh, Burma specialists draw from that is that Burmese military will have to be guaranteed a special position or special place in the Burmese domestic politics. And this might be a place that will go parallel or sometimes even um, supersede the authority of any civilian government. And the Chinese will see that this is a political reality of Myanmar that any government or any solution will have to accommodate. Anything short of that, we're going to see the military coup. And that's exactly what, the, what, exactly what, what happened two years ago in their view. Um, they don't necessarily think the current Burmese military's policy is the best option, because currently the policy does not leave any room for accommodation of the civilian or the de democratic voices either. The best solution right after the coup, I think the best solution that the Chinese have conveyed to the Burmese military has been that, well, why don't you use this opportunity to, to strike a deal with Aung San Suu Kyi? and try to have negotiation with NLD 
in the end, you can work out a solution because the current situation is in nobody's interest. NLD is, uh, is, is, is in ruins, but at the same time, you do not represent or claim any legitimacy either. And this gets to the interesting question of how the Chinese view the, uh, view the resistance movement, view the NUG, and also view the, uh, the PDFs. China traditionally has established a very solid relationship with the previous or the former key political players in the country, right? So these include the Burmese military, this include the NLD, uh, some of the 88th generation political elites, uh, and more importantly, the ethnic armed groups, especially those along the Chinese border. So China's relationship with these actors, with these, um, these, these players, have had a longstanding history. So I think when China looks at NUG, the question is that where does this legitimacy come from to be a legitimate and a credible political power uh, in Burmese politics today? And of course, the answer is that while well, NUG was uh, was selected, was uh, was established by the CRPH, and CRPH was uh, was made by uh, was created by a group of uh, MPs that won the election in the 2020 election. And I believe it is 17, uh, 17 MPs that created CRPH in, uh, in the February and March of 2021. But there is a numbers problem. So for the Burmese Ludol, the, uh, the parliament, there's a total of uh, 660 members. So I think for the Chinese, 17 MPs out of 660 clearly does not represent even the even even the, the five percent of the whole of the whole uh, the whole parliament, so that's where the the question of the legitimacy really really originates. Um, I think the Chinese are not necessarily comfortable with the PDFs because it is difficult to control this many organizations spread out in the country, right? So when the Chinese needs to protect their interest or protect their assets and nationals on the local level, they usually would like to rely on the government to do so. But when the territories, especially in the ethnic states, are uh, are controlled by the PDFs, they don't necessarily have anyone that they can count on to uh, to, to 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 deal with that relationship. So that is to say that in conclusion, the Chinese have been viewing. Burmese military with a lot of hostility and a lot of criticism. They also have been quite critical of Aung San Suu Kyi and NLD, uh, criticizing them for being politically unrealistic to push the envelopes too far. But in the end, they're also critical of the, of the NUG and the PDF because um, in their view, this current political chaos or this stalemate that they're looking at will have no um, visible solution when none of these, these powers, or none of these sides is willing to make a concession. It seems that everyone seems to believe that, oh, we have the future, we're going to win, we're going to prevail in the end. Uh, but the reality in the past two years is that we're just looking at a, uh, a stalemate, both politically and on the battlefield. Um, the postponement of the general election, uh, the decision announced yesterday by the uh, by the by the Burmese military is seen as a prudent one because in the current condition when the Burmese military controls uh some would say that 50 percent of the territory some would say 30 percent some the lowest number I've seen is 17 percent of the territory of course control of the territory does not equate to the control of population because the Burmese military control the big cities and these are the population centers but um that is to say that well if they are going to host the election there will be a significant challenge to the uh, to the legitimacy of that uh, of that election, uh, and they will not be able to prevent any security challenges or attacks against a polling station, which will make the uh, will make the, the 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 election even a bigger focus of international attention and international criticism. So basically, the overall the conclusion is that while well, we are looking at a political and military stalemate in in Myanmar, uh, there's no visible solution in sight unless and until uh, one or more sides or or, um, or players or political forces in the country is uh, is willing to make a concession. And currently, such um, such will is uh, is not identified. So I will stop there. Thank you, Anne-Marie. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you.
All right. Well, thank you to both Evan and uh, Yoon for getting us uh, whole kicked off this session with a lot of robust issues. Um, I think I'd like to, before opening it up, maybe use my prerogative uh, as chair um, to kind of ask uh, a series of questions, perhaps to both and maybe make them be linked. Um, Evan, since you went first, I'll uh, start with you. Um, you talked obviously about the need for sustainability um, in this issue of support for democracy. I mean, we all know that democratization or democratic backsliding is really primarily a domestic um, issue, right? Whether countries transition or not is really, you know, the, the work uh, and preferences of domestic actors. So at this period in time, um, are there domestic actors in Indonesia who would welcome support from external democratic countries? Um, you mentioned the role of the US post 98. I mean, I remember visiting Indonesia at that time, visiting the nascent uh, Ministry for Human Rights in I think 2000, when he had one secretary as opposed to the hordes of staff that most ministers had, he had two computers and, you know, the U.S. government provided computers and, you know, a whole bunch of things. I mean, the needs then were just completely different from where we are now. Um, so what, if any, is the demand side on that? from the Indonesian perspective. Oh, uh, I should answer uh, right now. It, I think that, I think we'll do it that way. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if that's uh, okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, no problem. Uh, thanks for, um, I think it's an interesting question and, and maybe I can speak from a kind of a narrow example uh, of, of the policy domain, which is kind of the defense side of things rather than uh, looking at uh, political parties and all of that. Although I would say that uh, in those other areas, I think there's certainly the demand is still there because across different sectors, whether it's about anti-corruption, whether it's about political party building, uh, electoral systems management, um, the need for capacity and expertise provided by external uh, partners is certainly still there. The issue is now that after 20 years, I think Indonesian actors themselves have the confidence that we know what we want, we know what we don't want, and we could do without your preaching of the values and norms that you want to uh, put forward. So I think that's why it's it, it's different, right? So in that particular context for the case of, of defense, I think you can make the case for sustainability if you develop, number one, local ownership and stakeholdership. What was different, I think, uh, from 20 years ago is that there were no local stakeholders and, and, and ownership from civil society standpoint, because when we um, ended the new order rule, there were none, right? Um, but in Indonesia, on the defense side of things, there are quite a number of the next generation who had like master's degrees in defense or strategic studies or, or IR who are interested in all of these things, but they don't necessarily have uh, the particular expertise uh, on, on, on some of these technical defense issues to kind of provide a critical voice to the government. And in fact, in a more unintended consequences, the US and, um, and the UK uh, in the mid 2000s actually supported what uh, is now the Indonesian Defense University. So they provided some 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 models, some training, and even provide like a joint uh, coursework with um, with Cranfield University in, in in the UK. In a weird unintended consequences, because the programs were not well thought out and was ended quite soon, the graduates of the Defense University are now sort of the more a critical mass of so-called defense analysts from around um, the country. But because the quality has been poor. All they do is basically echo what the defense ministry says without providing a critical checks and balances. So in that sense, um, uh, uh, the rise of the defense university actually made it worse for Indonesia's defense policy narratives and debate. So developing uh, a new way of thinking about local ownership uh, from the US is, is crucial. Number two is certainly figuring out that when it comes to the policy challenges, there are specific things, as I've said earlier, 
there are specific challenges that are within the purview of external powers to work on, whether it's about like technologies and, and capacity um, skills exercises and so forth. But there are things that are not within the purview of external powers to work on. For example, in the case of the military, this would be organizational systems, doctrine, um, and personnel management. No matter how much the U.S. want to try to do that, and the U.S. have tried to do that, uh, they have something called the Defense Reform Institute that ran out of the embassy a few years ago, uh, and it hasn't been successful because while the Indonesian military and the defense community welcomed the initiative, nobody wanted to do it because we know of the sensitivities and, 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 and the value content uh, that the U.S. put forward. And finally, I think if we can figure out a way around those two issues, local ownership and kind of the nitty gritty policy stuff uh, rather than the broad normative or, or, um, or kind of broad value content based, I think we can find a way that it's not that the external powers deliver, it's that the local actors themselves deliver with the help of external powers. And I think that's why it's different when we're just thinking about external powers supporting uh, uh, local actors. Thank you very much. Um, Yoon, could I ask you about how, if at all, the pandemic, the kind of uh, changes to China's economy, the uh, protests, et cetera, that we've seen over the COVID policies have kind of tarnished the China model, right? That Xi Jinping kind of put forth, as you've said, um, that you know its economy has declined for the first time or the the most time uh, ever. Um, we've seen some social protests, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, we've also seen um, you know polarization and dysfunction in the U.S. As that shifts, has China recognized that? And if they are kind of criticizing the Western model of democracy. Um, has it changed its narrative on pushing its own model at all? Uh, this is, no, that's a great question. I, I think this question, I hope this question will, will, will generate more, uh, more thought-provoking processes and discussions in, in China, uh, which I have not seen after the opening, uh, the reopening of the country. Um, I would say that first off, we will have to divide the past three years into at least two periods, right? So there's uh, the year of 2021, uh, 2020 and 2021, and then there was the year 2022. And the watershed event, I would say, is the is Omicron, which uh, appeared in the fall and winter of uh, the late in 2020, uh, 2021, and it became the prevailing variant. Um, in terms of the global pandemics in the year of 2022. So during the first two years, I think the general assessment in China still is that China's COVID policy, con uh, COVID control during the first two years was a successful policy. And it was not just because of Delta had a much higher fatality rate and not just because um, China was able to basically put the uh, the previous variant, the pre Omicron variants, under control in China, so lockdown, um, especially widespread or massive lockdowns of cities, that was more of a phenomena in the year of 2022. Um, so I think the the judgment in China still is that the COVID zero COVID policy for the first two years it was a successful policy and people were protected. But Omicron was really the one that changed the game because even with uh, COVID zero, the zero COVID policy, um, the Chinese government was still not able to put COVID under control in 2022, which led to the uh, massive lockdowns across the country. And the most famous one apparently is the one in the spring of 2022, the three months lockdown of the city of Shanghai, which basically led to a, a decline of the GDP of the city um, which was unprecedented in the in the history since uh, since basically 1979. Um, so I think starting with the uh, 2022, the government became much less hesitant to push this uh, this narrative. Oh, China's disease control model is so much more superior. I think the one message that they were trying to emphasize is that 
the Chinese government was still able to protect the Chinese people, while the Western government was not able, were not able to. And you would hear, uh, I remember that the Chinese media at that point would, would report daily the total number of, uh, of deaths in the United States associated with COVID, and also how low the, the rate of COVID infection is uh, was in China at that point. Um, but I think the, the, the questions with the skepticism about this position really started to increase starting uh, in the summer of last year when the lockdowns were not able to prevent the, re the emergence of new cases across the country. And we saw cities like Rumuchi under consistent or repeated lockdowns. So one lockdown after another, and some of the uh, communities in Rumuchi was under lockdown for more than 100 days. And these are not just any lockdowns. These are lockdowns that you cannot step out of your door. Um, so I think in, in, in these cases, this, the social discontent became uh, much, more, uh, much more vocal and led, leading to the, uh, the demonstrations and the protest after the, the 20th Party Congress, which uh, happened in, um, so basically one month after the Party Congress, we saw that the protest became a, uh, became a, 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 a norm almost across the, across the Chinese cities where lockdowns were happening. Um, the interesting, I think the question that people really debate because I think by that time, at that point, all China observers believed that Xi Jinping was a stubborn guy. He had decided to let zero COVID policy outweigh or overwhelm economic practicality. And he chose what he perceived to be social and political stability before the party Congress over the welfare of the Chinese uh, welfare of the Chinese people and the economic growth of the China, uh, of the Chinese economy. So I think at that point, observers across the board were convinced that Xi Jinping was not going to change. So I remember for China panels and discussions we had as late as mid November, people were still disputing that well Xi Jinping is not going to drop the zero COVID policy, but then he did, and he did it rather abruptly. Abruptly leading to, the, again, a, a new layer of criticism that the Chinese government, why was it not better prepared to handle the reopening of the, of the Chinese economy? So I would say that all in all, the Chinese government considers their, their first two years of COVID experience as still as a superiority, um, a, a manifestation of the superiority of the Chinese model. Although the last one year really tainted that reputation. Um, but whether this is a foreign policy gain, eventually this is a net loss or a net gain for the Chinese foreign policy, I think that probably will still take some time to, um, um, to test. Because I would say that the, at least in the early days, the Chinese vaccine diplomacy, uh, especially those in the Middle East and in some countries in Southeast Asia, and I'm thinking Indonesia and Evan can, can correct me, uh, at least in the early days, it was appreciated when uh, when countries in less developed less developed countries were not able to get on the priority list of Pfizer and Moderna in terms of the vaccine delivery. So now, of course, the efficacy of the Chinese vaccines that's a different story, and and that that tells a completely different uh, different picture. But uh, I would say that the Chinese are still trying to emphasize the point that China model of disease control. At the beginning of the pandemic, or for the first two years of the pandemic, was a successful model, but Omicron did not bring a rapid enough change of policy on China's part, uh, and that was primarily motivated, well, we all know, by the political consideration about the need for stability, need for uh, for for a good optics before the Party Congress. Okay, thank you so much for really making that distinction between um, you know the first two years and then the what last eight months or so. Okay, um, the floor is open. Who would like to jump in with um, some questions for either one of our participants? Sydney? Thank you. Uh, how is it for um, Yun Sen? How has China reacted to the sale of arms from Russia to Myanmar? Hi, Sydney. This is Sydney Jones, right? Yes. Hi. Hi, Sydney. <laughs> You're the 
it has been forever. Hope, I don't, hope everything has been well. Um, okay, well, if we're talk, talking about the earlier batches, th those that happened right after the uh, right after the coup, the Chinese thought that was a blessing. Why? Because right after the coup, China was pretty much the only external power held responsible for the military coup. They were seen as a patron of the Burmese military. They were seen as responsible and they were also being demanded to take actions to stop this coup or to reverse this coup. So by March and April, when, uh, when there were local forces starting to target the Chinese assets and the international criticism, and remember the, the burning of the Chinese factories uh, in, in middle, uh, I, I believe it was in Mandalay, um, at that time, the Chinese really felt that the heat was on China. And at that time, they were desperately trying to find that is there anyone who can also carry the weight? And the, when Russia stepped in, the Chinese thought that was a great diplomatic save. It was seen as a, as a, as a blessing for China. And then, of course, ASEAN later stepped in with a five-point consensus. And it offered China even a bigger shield that we can say that, oh, we're hiding behind, we support what, As what ASEAN is saying and what ASEAN is doing. But later, I think the Chinese perception about this, uh, this burgeoning relationship between uh, SAC, between the Burmese military and Russia became a uh, more and more troubling. Not just because um, the Burmese military were extremely belligerent against the, against the Chinese government, so one example was that in the August of 2021, the Chinese special envoy visited uh, visited Navy Dog. He met with SAC, he met with Mian Lai. He demanded to have one meeting with Aung San Suu Kyi. He stayed and waited in Navy Dog for eight days. And the Burmese military did not give him the opportunity and he had to return to China empty handed. So I think that's one example of how the Chinese were not pleased with, uh, with uh, the stubbornness of the of the Burmese military because they were still trying to convince the two sides that maybe there is a chance for a political uh for a deal between between Aung San Suu Kyi and me online and maybe China can be the can be the mediator in that in that process. And when they identified that the Burmese military is is stubborn beyond reason, uh I think the support from Russia became an enabling factor in that uh in, in Burmese military's uh military's decision making. And then we see that the Mia line visited Moscow. There were even more deals that were reached. Now they're even talking about nuclear cooperation between Myanmar and, and Russia. From the Chinese perspective, Russia is trying to gain leverage, right? We're also seeing, for example, in Afghanistan, Russia has agreed to supply fuel and food to, to Taliban for this winter. So the, this is seen as a typical Russian strategic maneuver to gain more leverage vis-a-vis -vis the West or, or vis -a vis the United States in the international arena. But not all of their moves really align with China's desired direction for the country to, to evolve. I wouldn't say that this disagreement has become so significant that it become a, a, a friction point between Beijing and Moscow. But at least this is not something that's particularly uh, is, a, is, a, is, is, is appreciated. Other questions, uh, Morgan? Here, here we are. Uh, thank you so much for, for your um, talks, both of you. Uh, Yun Sun, I think you've um, spelled out something that we've actually talked about all afternoon. I mean, you were online, I think, but uh, or maybe you were, I don't know. But, um, you know, this idea that China has opened and encouraged, you know, a third way between um, democracies and authoritarian regimes, you know, and this idea that you can have a semi-authoritarian or hybrid regime. And um, I think we've been talking about democratic backsliding as if we were, you know, on this kind of unilateral uh, spectrum, you know, where you backslide on a line between um, democracy and, and authoritarian context, you know, which in Myanmar, of course, doesn't really make a lot of sense because Myanmar was never a democracy per se, you know, it had some progress, but it was never, so it's not backsliding too much because, you know, it didn't have a lot of democratic features. Um, so I'm wondering if you, if you could say more a little bit about this, um, 
you know, third type of regimes. And, and you've said, you know, that Chinese, um, the Chinese government doesn't really care too much about the regimes that it actually interacts with. You know, it, it, it thinks about things in terms of economic ties, right, and economic um, exchanges. But I'm wondering if you could say something about this idea um, that there is a third type of those hybrid regimes, whatever you want to call them, and if it is something that the Chinese government, you know, encourages, you know, this trade-off that it, itself China is doing between um, stability and, and order and economic development, you know, that comes at the cost of civil and political freedoms and, and, and liberties, you know, and is that a conscious? I, I'm not familiar at all with China, so maybe this is a very stupid question and I apologize if it is, but, um, you know, I'm wondering if it is really a conscious decision to encourage, you know, this trade-off and to encourage those regimes to um, emerge and maybe join, you know, this circle of influence of China rather than um, be on, you know, the orbit of the US or the Western democracies or something like this. That's it. Thank you. I think that's a keen observation. And I really would love to hear what Evan has to say about this as well, because uh, I would know some of the the Chinese operation, especially on a local level, in the in a, in country cases, really really well. Um, I think my initial response, well, first off, I would say that what happened in Myanmar is a backsliding of democracy because uh, um, if you look at the the government of Myanmar from 2016, well, we, we cannot really talk about the Dancing government from 2011 to 2016, but the five years under Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD, at least procedurally. Um, it was uh, it, it was a democratic regime. They won the election uh, fair and square, and they were able to uh, to 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 run their government according to to people's will. That might be a very low bar, but uh, and there are also all these criticisms against um, against Aung San Suu Kyi for the Rohingya policy, for for her protection or shielding of the Burmese military. So it was definitely not perfect. But looking at what happened after the military coup, I think at least people here uh, in, in Washington, especially the Myanmar observers, uh, we all we, we we all our hearts really sunk that the progress made by the the so many well generations were not, maybe not generations, but at least the ten years from two thousand eleven uh, to two thousand twenty one, it was. Uh, erased, basically reversed and erased within one day. So I, I think for people who participated in that process, we do feel feel quite strongly and dearly about about this. Um, then about this 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 hybrid regime or this hybrid model, um, I, I think that's a very interesting concept because I think for the Chinese, what they think that they're providing uh, is a, an alternative that Western democracy is not a universal truth. And we have the right to be different. And maybe this is not democratic, but we have our history and we have our logic and we have our people's support based on performance legitimacy. And those performance legitimacy has afforded them this, uh, this, 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 uh, this government that has lasted for more than seven decades now, and they seem to be doing okay. And one thing that I think they really try to convey to the authoritarian leaders in, and I've seen this in, in North Korea, uh, I've seen in this case of Myanmar and the case of uh, even some of the African countries is that you don't have to win an election to be legit. If you can pr prove that your performance is, is effective and you can deliver to your people, then you can still claim legitimacy. And this is especially something that the Chinese have been trying to convince the North Korean leaders uh, for decades uh, without without success. So what type of support does China really really provide? Like I mentioned, there's political support. When you have a, uh, for example, a military government like in Myanmar, China is able to veto UN Security Council sanction resolutions against them. And this there's no bigger reward. There's no bigger deal than than this, especially for for military for military junta. Secondly, there's economic support. China will say that our trade relations, we don't follow sanctions. We don't have sanctions because you are not a democracy. And we will deal with you as a normal business partner, right? And well, they will say it's a normal business dealings. But in reality, when countries like Myanmar or Iran, they don't have, or Russia for that matter, when they don't have international partners to choose from, and China is the only game in town, Usually you can you, you, you can imagine what the terms really look like. Um, not 
necessarily always uh, against the uh, the 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 the, uh, the smaller nation or the, uh, the the countries that we're talking about, but um, but in a lot of cases that they are. And this type of economic support, I think they're the most important in the sense that they create revenue and that they create possibilities for trade and also create a optics of 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 a legitimate government being treated as a legitimate government and a equal international partner of China and China as the number two power in the world that that endorsement alone carries a lot of weight and certainly there's technical support what I just mentioned the digital surveillance the Chinese provisional equipments of training of software of how to use those uh, how to use uh, the training as for how to use the software associated with those, those digital surveillance the Chinese trying to teach elites and cadres of the authoritarian governments that how do you manage your economy how do you manage your oppositions how do you manage your online critiques so these are the technical know-how of how to deal basically with uh, the democratic elements quote quote in the in in, in the Chinese uh, in the Chinese narrative so again I wouldn't say that that China is deliberately trying to undermine democracy in Southeast Asian countries like that would indicate, for example, manipulation of, ele of, of election using uh, either technical skills or using uh, using corruption, using bribery to change the electoral result of a democratic process. I don't see China doing that, but I think the support, political, economic, and technical support that China provides to the authoritarian regimes do provide them with, uh, with a lifeline. And Evan, I would love to hear your views on this too. Thank you. Evan, would you like to jump in? Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I I fully agree with with you in there in terms of you know is China sort of actively uh, seeking to undermine democratic rule um, in Southeast Asia? I would uh, fully agree that's not the case, and I think this is where the challenge of using regime type uh, as as a starting point uh, for analysis. And in the case of Indonesia, Indonesia's worst relationship with China during authoritarian rule where we actually suspended uh, diplomatic ties uh, for about 20, 30 years. So in fact, China's relationship with Indonesia thrived precisely because of the opening that we had uh, since the late 90s. So in that sense, uh, you know, that's the first flaw. The second flaw is sort of you take away the agency of the local elites themselves who are unhappy in some ways with their own uh, democratic uh, checks and balances and stuff, and they find their own ways. Now in that process, uh, do they get help from time to time from uh, actors like China? Sure. But is China uh, um, actively designing and seeking all of these things? Probably not. I would say they're exploiting, certainly, um, and finding niche areas. You know, when the U.S. cuts off uh, military education and training uh, uh, with Indonesia or with, with countries like Thailand, this is where China comes in and provides the goodie bags, if you will. So certainly China is an opportunistic actor, I think, in that sense. And lastly, what's interesting is that when I hear Indonesian policymakers talk about their interactions with the Chinese, whether it's on the economic front, uh, security front, or political front, one of the things that they keep telling me is that it's all business with the Chinese. There is no these normative preconditions and, and issues relating to domestic politics. In fact, Luhut, uh, who is the coordinating minister for maritime and, and economic affairs and the designated special envoy for Indonesia-China relations went on record a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, um, saying that, you know, there is huge uh, flexibility of, of dealing with China because there is none of that talk about values and, and, and preconditions. So for, for the Jakarta policymakers, uh, China is just uh, a good business partner to work with. Uh, there is no uh, value-based judgments, and they stay away, actually, from domestic politics. In fact, one of the most enduring lessons, I think, in, in Beijing about Indonesia's um, ethnic Chinese relations came from the riots in 1998, when China made brief comments about those conditions. The relationship went even worse. Um, so I think China took it to heart and has never said anything uh, 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 on, on, on ethnic Chinese um, status or role or protection in Indonesia. And in fact, one of the most active Chinese public diplomacy in Indonesia over the last few years isn't with the ethnic Chinese communities, but it's with the Muslim groups. Um, so I, I, I'm failing to see 
uh, uh, the argument that China is actively seeking to undermine uh, democracies in Southeast Asia, particularly in, in, in a country like Indonesia. Okay, um, can I just follow up on that a little bit um, on this issue of kind of competition, autocracies and democracies? Because um, I'm not a China expert. So Yoon, I found your um, discussion of how as far back as 2011 with the regime change in Myanmar, China viewed Myanmar as a threat because of its domestic implications and that China did see competition with the US along this focal point of regime type, right? Um, and I guess it's just my lack of knowledge of China, but here in the US, we always hear it from the Biden administration, right? Biden has talked a lot about strategic competition between autocracies and democracies. And um, for somebody like myself who values democratic and civil and political rights for themselves, integrating that in geostrategic competition, I felt was a, a diminishment of the meaning of those values, but also a strategic mistake for the reasons you've identified, Evan, right? Which is that if there's one thing Southeast Asian countries don't like, it's being lectured to. So we've actually seen a shift in the Biden administration in its you know, recent national security strategy, DOD strategy, you know, they've made clear that they can work, you know, it's not authoritarian countries, it's quote unquote, authoritarian countries with revisionist intentions, right? Think Russia, think China, et cetera, not Vietnam, Singapore, all of these countries with which the US is really trying to build stronger partnerships. So they are trying to I guess we could say you follow the, the 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 more China model of not putting regime type at the center of competition. So I guess my question to you, particularly Evan, although I'd love to hear from you as well, Yun, is a has this registered at all in Southeast Asia, and b if so, does it change anything? Um, I. I think it's certainly the case that um, regime types, uh, again, you know, we in, in formal track one settings and, and official meetings and all of that, sure, we, we can talk about it and, and, and accept that and, and even use it from time to time. Like, you know, when Indonesia hosts the Bali Democracy Forum, for example, right? We get it. But when it comes to actual strategic competition, what is, what is challenging is number one, it's the elite relationship. Who, who is the best friends of China in Indonesia and who is the best friends of the US in Indonesia? And let's face it, when it comes to, you know, well, this is a bit of a no, slight oversimplification, but in, in actuality, I think um, the US's best relationship with Indonesia would be with the military. And it's likely that China's best relationship would be with the political parties and the business oligarchs. And if you ask uh, the government um, in Jakarta, and they would say that, most of their, shall we say, legitimacy performance comes from one group and not the other. And this is where I think it's, it has nothing to do with whether or not it's, um, it's, it's a democracy, but it's about the elite um, kind of relationship. Second, um, when it comes to the content, um, and you pointed out in terms of the political and, and civil rights, I think certainly nobody would, would, would disagree, right? That the more we have those rights protected, uh, it is certainly something that's a good thing. And, and if you look at the civil society in Indonesia, if you look at the press in Indonesia, uh, those things are, are certainly still a challenge and those things, uh, we still have a, a ways to go. But what's different is who's doing the preaching. When it comes to the United States, the issue is the standing of the United States, right? You will never get rid of what about in, in a country like Indonesia. Uh, we see this in the Ukraine war, for example, when um, surges of anti-US and anti-NATO suddenly came out of the woodworks. Now, some of it may be uh, disinformation and all of that, but certainly the the, the roots of, of, well, what about the Iraq war is certainly there. And bearing in mind, Indonesia actually was one of the most critical voices uh, of the US during uh, the Iraq war. So one way is to think about who is doing the preaching as well. I don't see that resistance when, you know, for example, 
uh, countries like Japan, uh, um, South Korea engage in specific uh, policy assistance programs. Uh, but when it comes to the normative content that comes out of the US, again, uh, I repeat the case of the defense side of things, there is no moral standing the US can talk about human rights on the defense when the US's best relationship with Indonesia on, on, on defense comes under the current defense minister. And the defense minister has come to Washington a couple of times and vice versa. So for me, um, I think, you know, the normative content of democracy versus autocracy shouldn't be at, at, at the forefront of Indonesia's um, a relationship with the US, at least from the US side of things. Okay, thank you. Um, Yuan, do you want to jump in on that or should we take um, another I'll just very, very quickly, I, I think it does register. If I remember a few years ago, there was um, observers in the policy community um, warning the, um, the, the Biden administration, I think this was 2021, um, that, well, when you talk about free and open in the Pacific, uh, do you recall that a good number of Southeast Asian countries are, do not necessarily meet the criteria? And by emphasizing and that 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 notion, um, you're sending the wrong message. And I think this particular um, this particular point was taken by the administration. Um, and I think there is a very conscious, um, very very conscious effort to make sure that Southeast Asian countries, especially if you look at the U.S. recent engagement, like IP uh, the in the Pacific Economic Framework or the U.S. ASEAN. Uh, leadership summit in, uh, in in Washington last year. Uh, I don't necessarily think that the regime type is a is a, is a dividing line for the U.S. policy, uh, but but it also depends on which country we're talking about. Like I think the the treatment that Vietnam has received is evidently different from the treatment that Myanmar has received. Um, but but yeah, I think Vietnam is a is a is a, is another interesting is another interesting case. Um, but also at the same time, I think as we talked a little bit about this yesterday, if you look at the democratically elected leaders with the vastly popular leaders in Southeast Asia, uh, the democratic leaders that are that that potentially are uh, good examples or good representatives of uh, of uh, electoral democracy are not necessarily enter China either. I'm thinking about Duterte, I'm thinking about Aung San Suu Kyi. So yes, they all had their um, innate weaknesses or their vulnerabilities, but there were specific reasons drove them very close to, to China, but they both had pretty terrible relationship with the United States. I think that's another reflection of another aspect of what you are what, what you are emphasizing, which is when US emphasizes the regime type and also the record of the democratic leaders and their system, uh, it, it, it could undermine their, their relationship. Like Evan pointed out, it's the relationship with the elites but uh, those relationships with elites do not always follow where we want it to go. Okay, um, we have a question here from Sheila and then the gentleman on the corner. Just wondering in terms of the impact of China's presence in, in these countries, particularly provision of aid and investments and uh, alleged bribes paid to local political leaders, isn't that somehow contributing to democratic erosion or authoritarian consolidation, not in a direct political way, but by bribing elites that undermines democracy and checks and balances and, and accountability? Um, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll share my, my view on this. I think the answer is absolutely. When China contributing to the local corruption or the local practice of, of, of corruption, it makes it even more uh, deeply entrenched, deeply entrenched in the in the in the social customs. Um, but the distinction that I would make is that China as a contributing actor is different from China being the cause. So even if you take China out of the equation, corruption and bribery are still going to exist in the in the countries that we're, we're, we're discussing. So I, I don't think China caused these problems, like the backsliding of democracy in Southeast Asia, I don't think China caused that either. But China's practice certainly has not uh, has 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 not um, <laughs> has not had a positive effect in the uh, in the directions that we want to uh, we want to see. Yeah, I, uh, I fully agree with that. Uh, China is not the cause. And I can use the same logic to talk about, for example, 
uh, U.S. Uh, Freeport operations in Papua has been documented in the past to have contributed to uh, violence uh, by the security forces. Now, does that mean a U.S. company is causing uh, the practices of violence of the Indonesian military and human rights abuses in general? Of course not. But has it contributed and made things worse? Absolutely. So I think this is where we, we should not let the local actors themselves off the hook. Um, so if, if you want to say what's causing uh, corruption or what's causing backsliding, I would look at first and most of the local actors. The external partners are just, are they there for um, uh, contributing and make things worse or are they actively shaping it? And I think it's not a, a, a clear cut answer one way or the other. Okay, thank you very much. Um, please. Uh, thank you both. This is a Myanmar specific question, so I suppose it's more for you. Um, we've had two years of the SAC signaling increasing financial distress um, and an inability to really stabilize the broader Burmese economy. Um, is there a point at which you see China sort of stepping in and saying that it's unwilling to provide any sort of financial lifeline uh, to the junta? I mean, I, I think of its compliance um, with or the sort of moment when EU imposed Mogi sanctions um, and it's stepping into divert funds to escrow from the Shui project as sort of an initial sort of willingness to cut off the junta. But I wonder if you see them taking more proactive steps at any point. Um, thank you. That's a great question because that's something that we have been observing. I've been trying to observe as well. And I know that Nikkei reported, oh, China is doing this, China is doing that. But if you look across the board, Chinese investment in the country, and if you look at the notice, noticeable mega projects, they're they're really minimal. So it, it it fits my earlier assessment right after the coup that China will be particularly careful about launching into Myanmar furthermore economically now the coup has happened because its reputational risk is going to make China the target of public opinions in locally. And I remember the public opinion nightmare that China got itself into by working with the previous Deng Shui government on a number of the, the projects, Misong Dam being on the top of the list. So the, the curious factor here is that now China's reopening. In the past two years, China was shut down. China was closed off. And, and, and particularly in terms of the sino Myanmar border, because they were trying to block off infection cases from entering China, they built a wall across the border. So I would say the last two years, is uh, it also offered China a very convenient excuse not to engage Myanmar e economically because it was under it was under this this COVID stress but now China is reopening and then I think the, the question of Myanmar and its role um, in China's regional economic framework will become more much more curious um, because the Chinese have seen Myanmar as, as a transportation corridor to both South Asia and to Southeast Asia. Um, and I think now the, uh, the China-Myanmar economic corridors, they, they, they want to push further. And now the, it seems that the military government is here to stay. Like I mentioned, that the basic judgment is this is a stalemate. Neither side is winning. But does that mean that China should hold off its economic engagement permanently because there's a stalemate or China should make some 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 steps towards uh towards more economic cooperation uh I my my uh, based on what I have seen with China's policy in the past I don't think China will refrain itself like it has in the past two years I think there will be uh economic deals there will be economic cooperations being announced down the down the road as for whether China is going to um, save Myanmar, save the military government in, in distress. Uh, I think here the Western countries and China probably have different understanding about the tolerance level of the Burmese government as for how much misery and how much human misery they're willing to tolerate. And here I think the case that's, that's comparable is actually North Korea. That um, I think what the Chinese have done with North Korea is that they provide North Korea with barely enough to keep it afloat. But uh, they're not going to starve to death. But they're not becoming uh, they're not becoming well fed either. So in 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 the case of Myanmar, if you think about what happened before 2000, uh, 2011, and there's a previous military government, it was under a lot of sanctions. 
um, and it was it, its economy was pretty much absorbed into the Chinese orbit, which contributed to the mi military's decision to pursue the seven step roadmap to democracy. And at that time, the bilateral trade was going relatively okay. So I, I don't necessarily think that the Chinese see that Myanmar needs saving at this point. And I do see that in the foreseeable year or two years, I think there is going to be incremental economic re-engagement and economic deals again between China and Myanmar. And part of that consequences like some Burmese observers would make is that um, what we're looking at Myanmar is a uh, return to history. Return to the previous, uh, was a pre-2011 history. That was the, the, the military plays a dominant role, the Western sanctions basically isolate the country and the country is being absorbed into the Chinese economic orbit. So we'll, we'll see whether that, uh, how fast that will transpire but for people who are, uh, who, 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 who are more knowledgeable about the history, I think this is an assessment that I heard from from more than one uh, from more than one Burmese long term Burmese strategist or or Burmese thinkers. Another factor that could play a role in this is secondary sanction, right? Um, if we really feel strongly about this, if 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 this is if Chinese economic assistance or economic cooperation with say Mogi. Um, is seen as such a detrimental impact, has such a detrimental impact on, on U.S. national interest or European uh, interest, then there is an option of secondary sanctions. And we've done that on North Korea, we've done that on, on Iran. And our sanctions on Afghanistan today is preventing China. Well, one of the reasons that has prevented China to, to launch into the country. Um, but whether that's worthwhile, I think that's a different political political debate and whether we would like to go that far for a what David Steinberg used to call this a boutique issue in Southeast Asia that 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 deserve us to have a face off with China do we want to put China on a secondary sanction for this issue fascinating question can I just follow up Evan since Indonesia is the ASEAN chair and you've been involved in a lot of these discussions um how would uh, Indonesia and ASEAN respond to the North Korea analogy? Because that is certainly one that is fairly horrifying to me. Yeah, uh, um, I've, I've certainly heard um, uh, that analogy as well. Um, I think right now, uh, th there are two different analogies uh, that, that's been thrown around over the last two years in, in some of these discussions. Certainly one is North Korea, uh, the other is Syria. Uh, in terms of you know uh, proxy wars and all of that, maybe not in the scale that we see in in, in Syria, um, but certainly what Yun said um, is, is 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 one of the fears that some of us may be trying to exploit in a way to raise the awareness of of, of Myanmar in countries like Indonesia, where nobody really knows about Myanmar, is the China issue, right? Uh, whether or not. Myanmar falls into the China orbit, whether economically or, or geostrategically, is certainly one issue uh, 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 that that domestic stakeholders in Indonesia have been discussing uh, ways to make it into a national issue. The second um, a problem, and, and I don't know how relevant it is in terms of the analogy with North Korea, but certainly from Indonesia standpoint, uh, the Rohingya refugees um, is is certainly been seen as as escalating uh, in terms of their trips to uh, to Aceh, um, and you know the reason why I said this because it made it into the foreign minister's annual press statement uh, just around the time when she was discussing about the creation of, of of the office of special envoy for Myanmar. So there are ways in which these analogies play out um, in the track two discussions, as well as at the track one um, uh, level in, 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 in Jakarta. Uh, but I think that hasn't been enough. I, I, I don't see yet enough of a concern that would motivate uh, and mobilize uh, 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 the region to actually uh, feel the urgency. Okay, guys, we're about to see a North Korea or a uh, Syria happening, so let's let's do something about this. I don't see that at all. In fact, I think it's it's worsening from from a diplomatic standpoint. I've heard that the discussions at the ASEAN meetings have actually gotten worse because 
uh, mainland countries, uh, um, uh, mainland Southeast Asian countries, particularly Thailand, have actually taken a few steps backwards rather than um, uh, than forward. So uh, certainly, I think the challenge is 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 actually worse from from that standpoint. Okay, and I think our last question goes to Sheila over here. Speaking of witty issues. <laughs> uh, I work on I work on press freedom issues, and I was wondering: Are there levers that can be used in China to address certain press freedom issues? For example, the uh, imprisonment of Jimmy Lai in Hong Kong, or is that almost completely hopeless to even think that there are certain pressure points that can be applied on China when it comes to issues of press freedom and human rights more broadly? Boy, that's a hard one. I mean, uh, when 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 the protest in Hong Kong happened and when the Hong Kong protesters were were were, were fighting for fighting for the basically the political freedom of uh, of the of the city according to the agreement that China had with with UK uh back in 1984. Um, I think some of the Southeast Asian countries express their support, right? Online, you saw this, what they call the, the alliance, the milk tea alliance, if you recall, this mm -hmm. was a few years ago. And it was people in Taiwan, in mainland Southeast Asia, and this was both mainland Southeast Asia and in maritime Southeast Asia. So people from um, Myanmar and people from Thailand were expressing their support for the Hong Kong protesters at that time, and it, it became such a popular social phenomena. And raising a curious research question or intellectual question that what does that mean for China's public diplomacy uh, in, in, this, in these areas uh, or in these countries? But unfortunately, I don't think that these movements or these campaigns really amounted to any policy impact in the end. And we saw that China's policy towards Hong Kong and the implementation well, the first is the making and then the implementation of the national security law in Hong Kong just proceeded without much of a pushback. So some would say that the Hong Kong is already a, a, a lost territory, it's, a, it's already a lost cause. Uh, it doesn't mean that there is not going to be future sparkles or future opportunities for, uh, for, for political uh, awakening again in, in Hong Kong. But at least for now, it has been uh, it has been extremely, I would say, near impossible in Hong Kong simply because how much pressure and how much scrutiny and how much stake that the Chinese have uh, have placed uh, have placed locally. So I think that definitely is a another interesting case. is is really Taiwan here, right? We know that China is going after Taiwan, uh, is trying to, for example, if there's one election that the Chinese do try to manipulate. I think it is a Taiwanese election. So uh, the, the use of online voices, uh, the online, the internet army, um, I think that will be a, 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 a the next test case of, uh, of democracy's resilience vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China's uh, undue political, economic coercion and influence. Thank you. Okay, well, we are just about at time. Um, I have the pleasure of thanking both of you for coming. <laughs> I knew that cop was going to come out the worst possible moment. Um, Yun, you mentioned all the conferences we've had <laughs> in person at Columbia. Evans attended them now. Um, NYU, we've had a number of great conferences. On behalf of the New York Southeast Asian Network, I want to thank you for coming. Um, virtually, and we certainly hope to get you <laughs> Murphy's Law, right? Um, some water, have some water. I'm going to. So I just want to thank you, and we certainly know that things are opening up. Look forward to uh, having the pleasure of having you both with us um, in person, because although technology is fabulous, it's still not the same as uh, being um, <laughs> in person. So on behalf of the New York Southeast Asian Network, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and um, thank the Luce Foundation for its very generous support of the New York Southeast Asian Network.